Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention please? Our next speaker is Mr. Gerbrand Schwalig, who is the Vice President, Enterprise Energy from Inmarsat. Gerbrand is going to be talking about the push it off solutions from Inmarsat. So please could you give me a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to present today. Um, I'll make it a little bit broader than the, than the push to talk uh, uh, solution. I'll talk about uh, solutions in general, how, how you can use satellite communications in the, in the smart grid environment. Uh, my name in Dutch is uh, Gerbrand Schallekwijk. It was a little bit changed during the introduction, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm quite used to that. No problem there. Um, let's see if I can get this working. Yes. What is Immersat? Immersat is a satellite communications company. Uh, now you ask yourself why does a satellite communications company present at a, at a smart grid conference? Uh, because we have a couple of solutions that actually work very well uh, in combination with, uh, with smart grid communications. So what, what are we? We are a satellite operator. We have 11 satellites uh, in orbit at the moment, which we are using day to day uh, for our customers. And the majority of the customers are people that operate uh, their businesses in areas where there is either no telecommunications or no reliable telecommunications. So ships, uh, aircraft, uh, media reporters in war zones, these are the people that use our, our services. A global company headquartered here in the UK, uh, City Road, uh, 1,600 staff in about 40 countries. Um, in addition to the 11 satellites we operate today, we have four satellites which are currently being built and that will be launched in the next uh, two, two and a half years. And if you look at the services we provide, it's really from, from small data, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications, uh, to higher speed data connections uh, that we can provide to these customers around the world. I'll go a little bit into the details about these satellites, just to, to set sort of a basic to go into the, uh, into the link with, uh, with smart metering at a later stage. Uh, the services I'm going to talk about primarily are running on the fourth generation of satellites. Uh, they've been launched in um, 2006, 7, and 8, and they're operational uh, as they are. They provide global coverage, so this is not a, a solution just for the UK or for Europe. This is something on a global scale. Um, and these, uh, these satellites will be in, uh, in use until 2020. And so the services that you, uh, you activate uh, today will continue to be, uh, to be running and being available um, until 2020. Global coverage. Because these satellites are geostationary, you actually use three satellites to cover the world. Um, the one that is covering uh, Middle East, Africa and Europe is centered over, uh, over Africa. And that's actually the footprint that we would, for example, use in this, in this particular part of the world. What this does is that um, anywhere you are in the world, you actually have a standard way of communicating. So you use the, sta the same satellite telephone, you use the same protocols. The solutions you operate uh, are, are the same anywhere in the world. Uh, and that's a very big advantage uh, to, uh, to a lot of our customers. Now, one of the satellites we have on order uh, is what we call an AlphaSat. It's a similar satellite as the I-4, uh, but it's, uh, we call it as a satellite on steroids. It does the same, but it does a little bit more, a little bit higher power, and it's got a little bit more uh, frequency and space segment that it is being used. And it's going to be the fourth satellite in that generation. So in a way, it's, uh, it's like a, a backup or a spare satellite uh, in orbit as well. So if one of the other ones would fail, we could actually replace it with, uh, with this one and still have a, have a global uh, 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 constellation. It's a project in combination with, uh, with ESA. The three satellites that uh, we're building in addition to, uh, to that one uh, are a different type of technology. It's called KA-band, uh, which is much more used for fixed satellite services, where the other ones are much more used for, uh, for mobile satellite services. Um, and it's, for Immersat, it's a big change. We move from mobile satellite services uh, via L-band to mobile satellite services via KA-band. Now, what is the big difference? KA-band provides much higher bandwidth. When we are talking about high bandwidth in, in L-band, we're talking about uh, uh, four, 462 kbps. Now we're talking about 
uh, 50 Mbps, which you can run over the same, uh, over the same networks, over these satellites. Um, first one is going to be launched next year, uh, the, uh, the ones after that in uh, 2014, and then a global uh, service will be available at the end of 2014. But for Europe, uh, the commercial services will become available at the beginning of 2014. Now I'll make the step towards machine-to-machine uh, -to -machine or to SCADA, which is actually the applications that are going to be used in the, in the smart grid uh, environment. So if you look at, at, uh, at satellite and how it's being used, um, then, you, then you see that uh, if you look at the, at the ecosystem uh, around these satellites, uh, people have been developing terminals and applications and solutions very specifically for machine-to-machine. Very low power consumption, uh, very easy to support and to maintain, um, and to be installed without any specialized uh, skills. And that's important if you, if you keep in mind where satellite will be used. Satellite will be used in areas which are difficult to reach, uh, are far away, uh, very remote places. And that might be in the UK, uh, but think about uh, Canada, think about Turkey, think about Africa, think about Brazil. Uh, then sometimes it's a journey of a day or more uh, to look at a particular device uh, and to see uh, if, it is, if it is working or not. So making that easy, uh, making the power consumption very low is very important for these, uh, for these environments. Um, and on top of that, you see that the, the usage, uh, prices of the usage, volume of data, of course, have been going down very much in line with the rest of the telecom industry. So where before satellite communication was perceived as being very expensive, uh, prices have gone down significantly, and it in many cases can compete uh, with some of the terrestrial uh, rates that are available and, and out there too. Now, is it something that everybody will use uh, in, their, in their smart grid communications? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it is really a niche. If you, take a, if you take communication in smart grid, then communications in a way is a niche and then we are, we're a niche within that niche. So we only take care of a very small portion. So in many, in many ways, it's a complementary uh, solution or a complementary service um, to whatever is out there already. And that can be wireline, uh, that can be fixed uh, satellite operators with, with uh, fixed dishes, or that can be cellular uh, GSM type of solutions. So the mobile satellite services are, are a very small portion of, of that. Uh, if you look at the total, uh, we've, we've seen some of the figures here, about hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, the mobile satellite services part will be, uh, will be very limited there. I think, just go back to the... Yes, just go back to this one. One of the things that we also see, and that we think is going to be uh, a trend uh, for the future as well, that you get more and more hybrid solutions. Uh, so you get solutions where terrestrial links, uh, cellular links, and satellite links are all going to be combined uh, and going to be integrated in one, one solution for the, for the end user. And in this case, this could be the utility company or the companies that manage these, uh, these networks. Um, and it's going to be important that standardization takes place, uh, that all these networks are talking to each other. Uh, but we already see uh, a very strong movement in that direction. And the projects where we are involved, one of the key elements is that we make sure that the, that the, the, the data that comes over the satellite link is actually can be integrated in the data that is available and is being used in these organizations already. Now, if you look at our portfolio, sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, the portfolio specifically on the, on the M2M, um, uh, comprises of three sort of families of products. Uh, one of them is the what we call ISAT Data Pro. Very small units, about 10 centimeters um, uh, wide and five, six centimeters uh, high. Uh, very low power consumption, but very low volumes of data as well. Uh, so one, 0K to 100K, um, which is going to, be, uh, going to be used. Big and M2M, uh, it's a different type of the technology. Uh, and that is applicable, it's, it's IP-based, applicable from 50 KB all the way to, uh, to 50 MBs. It's the most efficient way of doing it. Above that, you can go to fixed satellite services, where you go to a, 
uh, to the same big end family, uh, but then with different, uh, different pricing packages. These are volumes of data uh, per month uh, that, you can, uh, that you can use. The actual service, uh, and this is a little bit the, the details of these services. What you see is that all these services are global, and just depending on your requirement, you can actually pick uh, one of them. Uh, what you also see is that some of them are store and forward, uh, so that means that the, 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 the unit will send the message to the satellite, it will be delivered uh, with a delay uh, to, the, um, to the utility company, uh, and that is very much used for, uh, for reporting. Um, and in some cases, if delays are acceptable, uh, you can actually send a message back uh, and make an adjustment on the, on the remote uh, uh, unit uh, or the sensor or, or whatever you have on the other side. What we see more and more is that the utility companies demand an always-on uh, real-time connection. Um, and we talked about, or the earlier pres presenters already mentioned that, it, that there is very much a need to real-time management of data, real-time adjustment of, um, uh, of the, uh, uh, the grid, um, depending on what is happening in the, in the field. So delays of seconds or minutes are not acceptable anymore. You really need to have a real-time influence on what is happening. Now, if you look at the, at the infrastructure, um, basically you have your, uh, your RTUs, uh, you have a voice line with most of the units, you can actually put a, put a laptop to it. You have your satellite terminal, the link goes to the satellite and then to the earth station. Then from the earth station, so that's, an, that's a link that we uh, fully control. Then from the earth station, we will actually um, uh, establish uh, dedicated lines or dedicated networks to the utility companies. Um, and depending on the security that is required, um, we actually have uh, a separate network uh, for the utility companies that doesn't touch the internet at all. So it even doesn't touch any of the other uh, Immersat customers. It's just a network that is put together to support utility companies. So outside forces cannot influence what is happening on their, on their networks. Um, and from there, from these, uh, these land earth stations, these teleports, you will have connections back into the utility companies for the data, but also for the management of their, of their remote networks. Now this particular unit, uh, the Beacon M2M, is really developed for, uh, for remote usage. Uh, and what you will see is that all these features go back to this need uh, to have very little interaction with this unit. When it is out in the field, it should stay out in the field and you should not have to touch it for years if all goes well. So everything is aimed at uh, being able to do it remotely without the need to visit these, uh, visit these sites. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, if you look at machine-to-machine uh, -machine or SCADA uh, in the oil and gas sector, um, uh, we see quite a few of pipelining, monitoring, etc. In the, in the Americas, for example. Some of these units have been in the field for 15, 20 years and maybe only had two or three visits in, in that period of time. Uh, but these are in the, in the far north um, and, and it takes days to travel there or it actually takes a helicopter ride to travel there. Now can being an M2M, can it compete or how does it compare with seller? Um, on price, yes it can if it needs to be. But what's more important is, um, especially if you operate in, in, in a larger area or if a utility company needs to roll out the smart grid in a larger area uh, or even on, a, on an area where there's no cell coverage, you don't have to worry if there is cell coverage, you don't have to worry about the quality of the cell coverage that is there. So that's a big, big advantage. You don't need to work with multiple cellular operators. Uh, that's another big advantage. In many areas, one cellular operator will have a better coverage than another, uh, and you quite often are forced as a utility company to work with, uh, work with multiple. You don't have to deal with the multiple invoices, um, and you don't have any forced migration when the seller operator changes technology or, or adjusts it, that you don't have to, have to move along with them. Um, and, and satellite itself uh, is, is easy to install. The picture there actually shows that satellite is even used when the cellular network is very close by, and in this particular case, uh, both of them are used in the same situation. 
if you manage it, or if you combine it actually, uh, you use two networks to run, you can actually design it in such a way uh, that you do least cost routing, uh, or that you uh, increase your availability of your, of your network, depending on if you combine uh, seller with, uh, with satellite. But these are some pictures of how these terminals are in, are in action in utility companies, and I'll go into some of these a little bit later in the presentation. Manage and control. Having all these units in the field far away, and they have to report in a particular way, and they have to do the, uh, the, the, the job for you in a particular way, being able to manage them and to control them is key. Um, so what we have done together with, uh, with, uh, with our partners, we have an ecosystem of partners supporting the, uh, the M2M uh, and the utility sector, is develop a suite of, uh, of products and solutions that allow you to manage and control these terminals, these remote terminals. So one of the key things is that you can see if these terminals are still functioning, are they alive? Uh, do they have an IP connection? Uh, where are they? Um, and are they working? If they are remote, uh, these are, are important things to, uh, to see. When it is not working or when, when something is, uh, uh, is dysfunctional, you can actually retrieve diagnostic reports so you know what's actually the problem with the, uh, with the unit uh, or with the, uh, with the equipment behind the unit. Um, you can receive notifications when a network is down. And, and this could be uh, very important when you are talking about applications where uh, the, the, the um, uh, distribution automation is key, distribution control is key, where real-time information about your network is vital. So why would you use it? Basically covered that already. Now I will go into a couple of applications and, and solutions. Um, first one is the automated, uh, automated metering uh, and then using satellite backhaul. Uh, then I'll tell a little bit about distribution automation and how it is being used. I'll tell a little bit about disaster recovery and then field force automation. One of the key elements here is uh, reliability. And the percentage here, 99.9%, .9%, uh, is actually uh, the full connection. If you look at the satellite link, the percentages are much higher. If you um, uh, design it in a particular way, you can, re you can re realize much higher uh, percentages as well. But all this is about uh, tools uh, to manage your, your smart grid, and all of it, all our links will go back into the, into the management center of the, of the utility companies. So advanced metering infrastructure. A uh, key element here is that um, in the areas where there's a lot of smart meterings uh, around, uh, these are often used, or, or satellite terminals are often used as a data gathering point. So you could have a Wi-Fi network or a WiMAX network in a particular area. All the individual smart meters are reporting uh, into, the, uh, into a central point, and from there you have a satellite link uh, back into the, into the utility company. So where is this, for example, used? Uh, California, uh, we have a couple of networks where uh, 90, in some cases, or 95% of, uh, of the utility companies' uh, area which they have to cover can be, used by, can be covered by seller or other means. And then they have 5% where they cannot have uh, uh, smart metering uh, because the, 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 the network is not there or not reliable enough. And they basically put um, uh, uh, Immersat Began terminals uh, in there to provide uh, the data from, these, uh, from that 5% of the, of the California uh, region that they have to cover, uh, send it back to them. So they actually comply uh, with, the, uh, with the regulation that they have to have full uh, coverage uh, there. Another interesting one here is um, uh, uh, weather has no influence at all at our systems. So there's no rain fade, doesn't matter what kind of storm there is, uh, the connection will always, always remain. Um, the other thing is, is that, and, and in the US it's important, a lot of electricity is actually on poles. The poles will, will wiggle a little bit. Um, the satellite connections will remain uh, even when, the, uh, when the, there's a little bit of movement. Distribution automation, a uh, key element there is, is real-time. 
um, and basically what you get again, this is from the, these areas where um, there's either no reliable communication or there's non-communication, uh, or you put it in as a backup system. Um, the key thing there is that you have real-time information and you can real-time uh, close or open uh, particular elements of your, of your network. Uh, so reliability is key uh, and coverage is, is vital there as well. Substation automation, uh, very similar. Uh, requirements are the same, only the data requirements are much, much higher. So you're not talking about small bits and pieces of information anymore. There's much more a stream of information going, coming from these sites. Um, what we see quite a bit, and again, the US is, is in that area uh, a little bit ahead. Um, they are putting these systems in place uh, in, in case uh, there is natural disasters, uh, in case their existing uh, telephone infrastructure uh, breaks down uh, or, or, or is not reliable. And this is when they switch to, uh, to satellite to maintain their, uh, their network uh, integrity. Disaster recovery. Uh, this we see in multiple places. This also plays, for example, in, here in the UK. Um, when something happens, and this can be a hurricane, what we now have seen in the US, we see it frequently in the south of the US, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this can be a storm. Um, this can be an earthquake. It quite often means that all the existing infrastructure uh, is down. And this can be power, uh, but this quite often is also the telephone networks, the cellular networks, all of them are, are down. The only network that is not dependent on, these, uh, on that infrastructure is satellite communications. So what you see is that satellite communications in these situations is, is often used as, uh, as a fail-safe, as a backup, so that when the whole infrastructure is down, uh, it actually switches to, uh, to satellite communications. Um, of course, depending on where you are and depending on how, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, um, how often uh, you're affected by these natural disasters, you design your network. Uh, so if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Texas, uh, their um, uh, satellite communication is uh, one of the primary means of communications because they have, so often they have hurricanes which affect their infrastructure uh, that they decide, okay, we'll, we'll not do any, uh, any cellular networks anymore. Um, for all the vital communications, all the vital access points or nodes in our network, we're going to use satellite communications because we don't want to be dependent anymore uh, on, the, um, on, the, uh, on the environment. Field force automation, and this is the push to talk. Um, and this is very much, and again, in, in, this works in a way for, for the UK or European markets, but this is much more for, uh, for um, uh, developing areas or, or large countries uh, with a lot of remote stations. Uh, and this is about how do you communicate with your field force that is actually implementing and supporting and maintaining your, your power networks. Um, key element there, GPS tracking, having communication with them with regards to work orders, being able to send and receive uh, messages and data from them, um, and being able to cover them on, on, um, uh, on, uh, uh, on the full country or the full continent scale. Current solutions that they often use is radio in some cases, uh, 3G in some other cases. Uh, and again, the biggest issue is, is coverage and being able to reach uh, your field force when it is there. Uh, the solution is a push-to-talk solution, uh, a dispatch type of, uh, type of solution that allows the field force to communicate back with the dispatch center uh, real time and all the time, uh, and that in combination with, uh, with being able to track uh, where they are. Uh, the biggest project we have run is Electro. Uh, I just take a couple of slides out of a case study, which uh, a white paper we did with them, uh, which they presented <coughs> themselves. Um, and basically what they had is they're responsible for uh, a couple of states in, in Brazil uh, around uh, the Sao Paulo area, a uh, huge geographical area uh, where they have about 600 maintenance trucks that go into, uh, into remote areas of, these, of, this, uh, of this state. And what they used to have before is they used to have a radio system, a VHF radio system, which they used to communicate back and forth with their, with their drivers. 
Uh, of course, you can think about uh, 600 drivers and 20 dispatchers all talking over the same radio link, which was actually backhauled over satellite link, so there was a delay as well, is very inefficient. Uh, on top of that, it was very costly as well. Um, so what they wanted to do is, is change, uh, change their system, uh, and they basically came out with, a, with an open tender, um, which said, okay, um, can people come up with solutions and ideas how we can improve the existing, uh, existing situation? Uh, we worked together with a terminal manufacturer at the time, uh, with one of our local uh, service providers, and we put a, put a solution together uh, that allowed them to, um, uh, to continue doing what they were doing, uh, but then in a much more efficient way. And basically what it is being doing is every uh, maintenance truck they have is equipped with a satellite terminal, is equipped with a little box in the cabin, um, and what they do is they can communicate. Uh, carrier 1 is a cellular network, uh, carrier 2 is a cellular network, and carrier 3 is the satellite network. In other words, if the cellular networks are not available, uh, then the system automatically switches to the, uh, to the satellite network. Um, and the intelligence in the, in the box and the software allows these calls to continue, even if halfway the call uh, the cellular network breaks uh, or a different carrier is going, to be, is going to be used. So this is how it looks in the, in the vehicle. A uh, little unit on the top, uh, which is on the right side, and in the truck you basically have uh, a small box and a mic, and, and, and that is it. Key element there is these are uh, engineers in the field, very rough. Uh, the roads are very rough or non-existing, so the, the element there or the key element there is, is again is reliability and ease of use. And so they, the guys in the truck, they only have one button, which is a red one, is to push and, they, and then they can talk. Uh, the dispatchers on the other side, um, they have a little bit more complex, they have a software system and they can actually link uh, connections to each other if people want to talk to each other uh, or if they want to talk to a dispatcher or if information has to be sent, they can actually manage that from the, uh, from the dispatch center. Phase one is being rolled out. It's being operational since, uh, since the beginning of this year uh, on all these 600 trucks. Um, phase two is going to be that we start adding um, uh, ruggedized uh, iPad type of devices to the, um, to, the, to the setting as well, so the engineers can, uh, can communicate and can send data and, and information over these links when they are operating in these remote areas. Sorry for this. Financially for them, uh, big, big change. Uh, they had to invest uh, close to $6 million. And there you have to keep in mind that it is Brazil. So everything that you bring into Brazil gets like a close to 100% tax on top of it. So if you would do a similar project here in Europe, it would probably be half the price. Um, OPEX, which they had, is they went live at the beginning of, uh, beginning of the year. Uh, they basically deactivated their full radio network. Uh, all the units are, are up and running. Um, and in their OPEX, just their running business, they're already saving a million and a half every year. And that's on top of the efficiencies they had in, in that they can communicate with everybody all the time. Next step, like I said, is to, uh, to uh, implement the, uh, the data uh, capability as well. So conclusion, um, why would we use satellite in, in, in the, in, in the uh, utility sector? Uh, it is really about, about connectivity uh, and about a uniform connectivity and closing the gaps in the, in the terrestrial network. It's about very rapid, deploy, rapid deployable systems um, and being able to meet some of the regulatory deadlines. Yeah, we were just talking during the break, should we uh, reward people or should we punish people to move them into smart grids and to move them into reducing energy consumption? In some countries, there is a, there's a punishment system in place. Um, and when you are faced as a utility company with a punishment system, so basically big fines if you don't roll it out in time or if you don't have 100% coverage, then satellite communications is a very easy way to reach your 100% your coverage. Um, IP connectivity, flexible data performance. Um, quite often, 
more reliable than, uh, than the existing infrastructure. Now, what's the case for Immersat? Because Immersat is one of the providers of satellite communications. Um, global, uh, so it's one uniform solution that works around the world. It's an, it is L-band, sorry for the technology, but it's an L-band spectrum. It means that it is not affected by anything that's happening in the weather. Um, and it basically allows you to, to uh, how do you say, to operate in a very easy way uh, for, for, your, for your company. Uh, and that goes from antenna pointing installation uh, all the way to managing, uh, managing your networks. Because satellite is not a solution for everybody, um, we actually put a white paper together, and we actually put it on, the, on all, the, all the desks. Uh, and if you, if you want to have more or receive one electronically, let me know. It's basically, uh, you have to ask yourself seven questions. And if you go through these seven questions, uh, you can actually decide what type of SCADA network, what type of M2M network uh, you need or you require uh, for your requirements or for your solution. Uh, and then one of the outcomes will there will be if satellite communications is, is yes or no a valid solution for your, for your, um, uh, for your problem. With that, I'd like to, uh, to thank you. Um, and I'd like hand to hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Gerben, just wait for a second. If you have any questions for Gerben, please raise your hands. Any questions for Gerben? Yes, there is one. Just wait a second, sir. Please uh, uh, wait for the uh, mic. Also, if you could give us your name, company, and job title, please. Hi, um, this is Vikrant from Qualcomm, uh, manager in business development with Qualcomm. Uh, thanks for the very nice presentation, and good to know um, uh, that this market can, I mean, uh, satellite can help to reach 100% connectivity where there's no cellular connectivity at the moment. Um, so when you mentioned that uh, the um, the power has uh, the power consumption has reduced. I, I assume you mean by the old satellite solutions. But for the, with, as compared to the cellular, for the like for like comparison, how where, where does the power stand uh, in terms of using satellite versus um, say cellular? And the second question is, uh, uh, cellular communications has benefited because of economies of scale. So even then, you mentioned the cost has gone down. I assume it will still be costly because it's a niche of a niche market, as you mentioned. Or is, is it comparable? If you, I'll, I'll do the power consumption uh, first. Uh, so it depends on the type of unit you use. If you look at the, uh, at the smaller units, uh, which are for the smaller data, um, then it's really very low. So these are units that you can actually operate on a battery for a very long period of time. Uh, if you look at the larger units, you actually need a power source, so you need uh, solar panels or those kind of things if you operate in, in a remote area and keep it alive. Uh, actual usage, it depends on uh, where, the, where the cellular phone is in comparison to the network, um, as well as, as the uh, satellite communications, uh, where it is with regards to a line of sight to the, to the satellite. Um, but the key thing is, is that power consumption has gone down in, in such a way uh, for satellite terminals that you can actually use them in remote environments and you can power them and continue to have them powered uh, using, uh, uh, using uh, solar, for example, uh, or using batteries, which can cover then up to, up to a year of usage of that particular, particular unit. Uh, so, um, yeah, comparing is maybe difficult. But the, key, the key message here is that you can use them in very remote environments. Um, almost self-sufficient. Um, then if you talk about cost, uh, of course, economies of scales in cellular will always uh, be better uh, than in satellite communications. If you just look at the number of terminals, when we talk about a big production line, we're talking about a couple of thousand terminals. Uh, that's a different scale uh, than when you talk about cellular networks. Um, putting up a satellite op, up is also more expensive than, uh, than putting up uh, cell towers in certain areas. And so the um, uh, prices have gone down uh, and they can compare depending on, on locations uh, with, uh, with, uh, with seller. In areas where, um, where there is plenty of seller, uh, seller will always be, uh, from a pricing point of view, uh, have an advantage over satellite. So you really have to see it complementary. Um, so the areas where the cellular network, where reliability goes down, 
in, in cases where reliability is important, uh, people are willing to pay a bit more for the equipment, and maybe also for the service, uh, to, to put, uh, put a reliable link in. Um, and I think that you have to look at it from, uh, from a complementary point of view. In a situation where people are replacing uh, cellular with uh, satellite communications, uh, it's always, always uh, because of the, of the reliability and about standardization. So the total cost of ownership um, goes down, and then they will have to look at how much it's costing them if they have to send somebody out to repair, how much it's costing them if they cannot uh, reach a certain site remotely uh, or real time. So if you look at total cost of ownership, then in some cases it tips to, uh, towards seller, uh, satellite. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions for Gerben? Please raise your hands. There's one more on the left gentleman there. Let's wait for the mic, sir. So please could you give us your name, company and job title? Yes, Emmanuel Masson d'Auxerre, Tele Toyale Solution. I have a question regarding the backup plan you may have. If I understood well, you have one satellite per region. So what happens if the satellite is not working anymore? I mean, the region is switched off for everybody. And then also regarding the earth station, I assume maybe you have many earth stations per region in case of uh, earthquake or hurricane, but what, what are the backup plans for, uh, for your technology? Yeah, so if you look at the satellites, uh, the satellite networks, what I was saying, the one we use at the moment is the fourth generation. Um, for most of the services, they are backwards compatible to the third generation. Uh, so that means that we can switch back to third generation. Uh, you might use some of the advanced functionality, but the core uh, functionality in many cases is maintained. Um, I also talked about uh, us launching this AlphaSat satellite, which is basically the fourth satellite uh, in this constellation. So that means that uh, we have four satellites to maintain the same global network. So in case one of the satellite goes down, uh, for whatever reason, and, and that, that hasn't happened uh, at all. Uh, normally, when a satellite is lo is is there, it will uh, it will keep uh, it will keep functioning without any problems till the uh, till the end of uh, end of life. Uh, but in the case it might happen, we could actually um, relocate uh, uh, one of the four satellites, replace it to the one that is uh, that is faulty or or has reduced reduced functionality, and then we have a global network again. That will take some time, uh, so you will have some, some period where uh, coverage is not there. Then on the teleport side, uh, every satellite will have multiple teleports uh, looking at it. Uh, so in case one of the teleports, um, or one of the connections to a teleport is not functioning, uh, then the teleports are redundant as well. And within the teleports, there's a lot of redundancy as well. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions for Gerben? Please raise your hands. I suppose that's better. Thank you very much, Gerben.